The next item of business is topical questions, and at question number one, I call Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on targeted councillor funding for the colleges and universities. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Since 2019-20, we have invested over £13.5 million to provide almost 90 additional councillors in colleges and universities, exceeding our programme for government commitment to support the recruitment of 80 such posts. We are committed to meeting our programme government commitment to provide additional funding for the entirety of academic year 2022-23. We are the only UK nation funding student councillor provision in this way. Pam Gossel. I thank the Minister for that response. Last week, the Education, Children and Young People's Committee published the College Regionalisation Report. The report found that this targeted council funding was critical for students. So can I ask the Minister, has demand for mental health counselling increased over the four-year period in which de dedicated funding for councillors have been provided? And how will future demand for these services be met if this financial support is not available beyond the end of this academic year? Minister. Well, just on, on that last point, what, what I would uh, say to Ms Gosal is uh, one of the things we have committed to is taking forward the publication of a Student Mental Health Action Plan. Uh, that will be forthcoming very shortly. We have not made any final decision in respect of further funding beyond the end of the year, so no final decision has been taken in that regard. We recognise uh, the uh, importance of the investment we have made thus far. Uh, we do want to see uh, that uh, it be the work that has been done there to be enabled to continue to support students through what we know has been a, a difficult and challenging time. And fundamentally, that is what the Mental Health Action Plan will continue to seek to respond to. Pam Gossel. I thank the Minister for that response. Minister, we already know the drastic reduction some colleges will be making in response to the SNP's funding settlement. One college is planning for staff redundancies up to 25% over the next few years. This is not a unique situation. 21 college principals have written to the Scottish Government pleading for help. These counsellors can provide a life-saving service for many students who are struggling with their mental health. Following these pleas, can I ask the Minister, will he set out the Government's position on compulsory redundancies and ensure that all college students can access the services they need? Minister. Well, just on uh, the point that Ms Gosal has made uh, around the letter from the 21 college principals, I am aware of that correspondence. Uh, we will, of course, as you would expect of the Government, uh, reply to that. But what I can say is there have been very close contact with college principals over the uh, last period to discuss uh, the very issues that we are touching upon today. I have made clear, as clear to them as I am to Ms Gosal uh, around our commitment to the Student Mental Health Action Plan and what we might be able to do uh, in subsequent years. In relation to funding uh, for colleges, of course, we have leveraged in additional uh, resource for colleges for this coming year. But I would respectfully say to Ms Gosal, it isn't good enough to stand there as she does week in week out yep. to call for additional funding Absolutely. for not just this sector but virtually every sector across government yes, expenditure absolutely. without identifying where it will come from. Absolutely. So I look forward to hearing her see where that will come from now. Thank you. As members might expect, there is a lot of interest, so concise questions and responses will enable more members to take part. And can I call CoCab Stewart? Um, thank you. Uh, my understanding is that since 2019-20, uh, the Scottish Government has invested in almost 90 additional councillors in colleges and universities. Uh, some of these institutions are, of course, private organisations and have their own role to play in ensuring provision for the well-being of their students. Can the Minister say something about how the work of these professionals, including those uh, provided through government funding, will complement the work of the upcoming student mental health plan? Minister. Well, let me pick up on an important point that uh, Colcap Stewart has made. She is right to identify that the institutions that we are providing funding for uh, fundamentally have uh, a core responsibility here. They themselves have to make sure that they are adequately responded to and supporting their students' uh, mental health uh, needs. Now, we have, of course, assisted with that. We provide a substantial 
package of funding to universities and colleges to provide this additional funding to support the recruitment of these counsellors. And through our Student Mental Health Action Plan, we will seek to build on that to make sure that we are supporting the resilience and mental wellbeing of students across the country. Katie Clark. 128,000 people have signed a petition to the UK Government calling for the creation of a statutory legal duty of care for students in higher education. A duty of care already exists for staff and for students under 18. Would the Minister explore introducing a statutory legal duty of care for students in colleges and universities? Minister. Yeah, well, I can't earnestly say that it will be me that said uh, doing it, of course, but that is something I think that the government should reflect on. Willie Rennie. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more positive what the Minister says, that no final decision has been made about future funding. But it does leave these staff in limbo, and I hope that the Minister will act with a little bit more haste to make a quicker decision about this. Because these mental health counsellors have provided an invaluable service for vulnerable students across the college and university sector. So how much longer will we have to wait? Minister. Look, I understand the point that uh, Mr Rennie makes, and it is one I take uh, it seriously, because we do have to try and uh, give uh, that clarity. He will uh, understand, of course, we have to go through uh, the usual process that we undertake, and we have made that commitment to the Student Mental Health Action Plan, which will be forthcoming very soon. And uh, my own perspective is that we shouldn't disaggregate these issues too much. But I, I take on board the point, and it's something we need to provide in terms of clarity to the institutions as soon as possible. Ross Greer. Thank you. The health and wellbeing census shows that for many young people, challenges with their mental health begin at school, before college or university. So can I ask the Minister for an update on what progress has been made towards the Butte House Agreement commitment that every young person has a right to access in school mental health counselling if they so require it, which should hopefully in turn reduce the demand for college and university mental health support services? Minister. Well, uh, this is a, a fair reminder that we have a duty to support the uh, mental wellbeing of all uh, young people in Scotland. We continue uh, to provide uh, £16 million to local authorities towards the commitment to make sure that every uh, secondary school has access to counselling services. Authorities across the country have confirmed that all uh, schools do have uh, such uh, access. Authorities provide us with six monthly reports on the services and the latest reports to be analysed show that just over 14,500 young people accessed the service between January and June 2022, with over 6,000 of those young people reporting improved outcomes, with the majority of the remaining young people still accessing the service and with their outcomes uh, to yet be captured but to report it in due course. Question number two, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to recent reported analysis by Health Equals, which shows that poverty-driven health inequalities are reducing life expectancy amongst people who live in the most deprived areas. Minister Marie Todd. We are using all of the powers and resources available to us to tackle poverty, reduce inequality, increase healthy life expectancy and thus create a fairer Scotland. The Scottish Government has allocated almost three billion across 22 to 23 to mitigate the damage inflicted on households by the UK government's cost of living crisis. We are providing free school meals, increasing the numbers of hours of free childcare. We have already increased the Scottish child payment to £25 per week, supported 1.85 million households with council tax reduction and uprated all benefits that we deliver. We will continue to deliver free prescriptions, concessionary travel, free personal care and our fair work agenda. Foisal Chowdhury. <coughs> I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, as co-convener of the cross-party group on improving Scotland's health and as a member of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I am well aware of the uh, disparities faced in Scotland in terms of health. In 2018, a study showed that a boy born in Muir House had a life expectancy of 13 years shorter than that of a boy born in neighbouring Cramond. Analysis from the Health Foundation reported that the average life expectancy in Scotland has reduced by 4.4 years since 2013. In addition, drug-related deaths have increased and are 18 times higher in the most deprived areas when compared to the list. Can the Minister confirm 
what steps the Scottish Government have taken to address these health inequalities and the specific health conditions uh, that disproportionately affect those from the most deprived areas? Minister. So we absolutely recognise the clear and inextricable links between health inequalities and poverty and that's why we're using all of the powers and resources available to us to support families as far as possible and to tackle the underlying causes of inequality in our national mission to tackle child poverty. We're also, um, as you're aware, being um, on the CPGs that you're in, we're, we're also um, targeting people who have low incomes in our reaching out to um, provide healthy, um, life-changing, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we are also um, targeting people who live in poverty with means to stop smoking. Measures like the minimum unit pricing of alcohol, which was aimed at the whole population, had a particular impact on people who live in poverty. And those who live in poverty were the ones who were most helped by that policy. Foisal Chowdhury. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, for individuals with diabetes, poverty-driven health inequalities are preventing them from accessing technologies advanced uh, in the treatment of their condition. This has been highlighted by Diabetics Scotland. Diabetics Tech cannot wait campaign. This technology has a potential to change and indeed save the lives of those with type 1 diabetics. It can also reduce serious complications and the strain on the NHS. Can the minister advise what action it will take to tackle the inequalities of access to the hybrid closed-loop diabetics technology in relation to so, so, uh, its social economic background? Minister. A absolutely, and it's a great question. Those people have real difficulty accessing health care and navigating health care. One of the reasons that people who are experiencing health inequalities suffer poorer outcomes is because the system fails to respond to them and listen to them in the way that it does for those from a wealthier and more educated back background who are more able to advocate for themselves. So undoubtedly, we will be making sure that the system begins to listen to absolutely everyone. We have a whole lot of money going into, um, and I can write to the member with details of how much money there is going into those particular diabetic technologies. It is a tragedy that people, one of the greatest predictors of people's um, health and life expectancy is their wealth. And it is an absolutely brutal tragedy that this parliament is determined to tackle. And we will tackle it, but we will need cross-party support in order to make the bold decisions that do fundamentally tackle the underlying causes of poverty as well as ensure that people who are living in poverty can access equal health care. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. The analysis that uh, Mr Chowdhury refers to it makes it clear that 13 years of callous Tory austerity is now impacting every inch in the UK. Recent research by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health also linked Tory-led austerity to worsening health outcomes in the 20% most deprived areas of Glasgow and Dundee. So will the Cabinet Secretary just reiterate that the Scottish Government is committed to taking action within its powers to tackle the root causes of poverty and associated health inequalities? Minister. The member. The member is absolutely right to raise this issue and in fact, in fact Foisal Chowdhury also mentioned the key date of 2013 for being when we started to see life expectancy reduce in Scotland. That is, the academics tell us, because of the Tory Lib Dem austerity measures that they brought in in 2010, which, which had a direct doubt which, the minister. which is a, a, a policy 
which is absolutely life-shortening for people in Scotland. It has had a life-shortening impact on people living in Scotland. I hear them chuntering from a sedentary position. 16 years. The academics are exceptionally clear on this point. Austerity, the political choice to pursue austerity politics, has been life-shortening for people in Scotland and continues to be so. Thank you. That concludes topical questions.